Okay, we are in session number three of the Sermon on the Mount. And this is Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 48. We may not get through all of it tonight. And that's fine. That's a lot to cover. If we do, great. If not, we'll split it up and we'll finish it next week. But it's session three, Matthew 5, 21 to 48. And the title of it is True and False Righteousness. That's what I've entitled it. Now, last week when we left off, we talked about how the Beatitudes kind of set up the characteristics of the kingdom servants, those who would be followers of Christ. What are the characteristics that they should possess? And he's talking to his disciples. Now, there are other people hanging around the outside just listening in, but he's teaching his disciples. So he's talking to believers, if you will. So he's talking to us. He's talking to tell us about what type of attributes we should have, characteristics we should have if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ. And then last week, we talked about how we were supposed to display those um, characteristics. We were supposed to be salt. We were supposed to make uh, humanity better, preserve it, like salt would do back then. And we were supposed to be lights, to reflect his light to humanity, to show his love to the world so that they would come and follow him. Uh, this week, we're going to kind of go back and continue what we were talking about in the Beatitudes. And then we're going to talk about a series of um, examples that Christ is going to give for how we should put into practice those characteristics that he listed in the Beatitudes. So before we get started, I have a question for you. What is your first reaction when somebody cuts you off in traffic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's happened to me the last couple of Sundays, or a couple of Wednesdays coming down here. Coming down 35, there's been somebody either merging or coming from behind me that's kind of done the weave and not being too careful where they're going. I use that for an example. It could be, how do you react when somebody does you wrong? You know, the, there was an old song about somebody done him wrong or something like that. A country western song. I don't even remember more in the words than that. But how do you feel when somebody does you wrong or inconveniences you or gets you in your way when you want to go somewhere? First reaction of a lot of people is to get mad or to take, to retaliate, take vengeance. Back in the time of Christ and in, in tribal societies then and in tribal societies in many cases even today, you know, honor revenge is a thing. If your family's done wrong, then you have to retaliate against the family or the person who's done you wrong. And in some cases, there have been, you know, major loss of life. I guess that's a nice way of putting it. Major loss of life when people have tried to get even because that's their culture. Well, it was kind of the culture in Jesus' day, too, is to get even when somebody did you wrong. So, beginning at verse 21, Jesus is going to give us a series of six examples that contrast how the Pharisees read the law, and in most cases, this was the law of Moses. In a couple of the cases, it's actually the Ten Commandments. How they viewed it, and how he fulfilled it. And remember last year, or last year, last week, I said that fulfilled doesn't mean he accomplished it. It means he expanded it to what the original meaning was. So it's just not the letter of the law, it's the spirit of the law. And he's going to make a contrast between those two. And as we go through each of the different examples, you're going to hear, uh, you have heard it said to our ancestors, or you've been told in the past, or you've heard it said. Because the people back then not only had the 
written law, the Levitical law, and the Ten Commandments. But they also had all the oral traditions that the Pharisees had put on top of it. Their interpretation of the law and all the little details that they added into it. In many cases, warping the original intent past anything that was believable. And every time he starts with, you have heard, or it's been said, he comes back and says, but I tell you. And it's important to note that when he says, I tell you, he's speaking as the authority. Rabbis back then, for the most part, when they said something to the crowd, they quoted some authority. And remember, Jesus was said to teach like one with authority. He didn't quote somebody else. He quoted himself. So a lot of times he answers the pharisaical uh, statement with, but I tell you this. And when he tells them this, he's not trying to cover every single possible situation they're going to face. To do that, he would be back into giving the Levitical law again, you know, trying to cover everything. Instead, he's basically giving us a sample of how we should think about God's law, how we should uh, interpret God's love for humanity and how we should react to it. Not an exhaustive list of everything. If it did, it'd probably be bigger than our Bibles if he tried to cover every situation. So we're going to start off with the Ten Commandments that deals with murder. So, got your Bibles. We're in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, but I want you to put your finger in Exodus 20. If you can flip back and forth. If not, then I'll read it for you. But Exodus 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are located. So the first one has to do with murder, and that's Exodus 20, verse 13, and it's pretty straightforward. You shall not murder. That seems to be pretty clear, right? You shall not murder. So let's see what Jesus has to say about murder. So Francis, would you read 21 to 26, that little section? And yours is King James, as I remember? Yes. Okay, 21 to 26, that little section. Ye have heard that it was said by the, them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hast ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First to be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out of sin, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Okay. And the whole one, verse 21 says, You have heard it said to our ancestors, Do not murder. Jesus is basically quoting the Ten Commandments. Do not murder. And then whoever murders will be subject to judgment. Now the implication here is that Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. They're the ones who interpret the law. That their interpretation was very, very literal. When the Ten Commandments says, do not murder, they're talking about the physical act of taking somebody's life. They took it extremely literal. Uh, it's wrong to take a human life. Would not argue with that. 
But Jesus expanded that to talk about the emotions that could maybe lead to the physical act of taking somebody's life. Uh, notice verse 22. But I tell you. So again, but I tell you, Jesus is speaking as the authority. He's not quoting some other rabbi. This is Jesus talking as himself. Everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. So is it wrong to be angry? No. No. Why not, Mike? Because righteous anger. Okay. There's a difference in anger, basically. Yeah, go ahead. Righteous anger. Is acceptable. Okay. But anger directed toward a person for the purpose of insult or harm is not acceptable in God's eyes. Okay. Anybody else got a thought? Everyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Anger in and of itself is not wrong. In fact, in some of the other places in the gospel, they talk about getting angry because of something that happens. But again, we go back to the intent here. He's taking the literal meaning of don't take somebody's life and expanding it to include don't get so mad at them that you might kill them. Look at why you are angry. You know, if you want to interpret it exactly as the words say, who is angry with his brother, if you have a sibling, have you ever been mad at your sibling? If you tell me no, I'm going to look at you strange because I think we've all been mad probably at a brother or a sister for something. Um, but have you ever been mad enough to want to do bodily harm? I would hope not. And again, we're looking here at the reason behind the anger. As Mike said, there is such a thing as righteous anger. We should be angry about some of the things that go on in the world today. You look at uh, some of the brutality, some of the uh, murders in Kansas City. We should be mad about some of the things that are going on. But that's not the type of anger he's talking about here. He's talking about the type of anger where you're going to be the one causing the harm to somebody else. But then he expands it. And whoever says to his brother, my translation says fool. What did yours say, Francis? Fool. Fool too? Okay. Uh, let's see, what does the New International say? Anyone who says to his brother, raka, fool. The, the word's basically the same. It means basically empty-headed. means you don't have a brain. And, and then a little bit further on, he says, if you call him a moron. Well, again, moron is you empty-headed so-and-so. You know, that's what he's saying. We are t taking the person and we are devaluing the person. Are we mad enough to cause bodily injury? Maybe. If you're mad enough to call somebody empty-headed, moron, I can think of some other words that I have heard in other places and other signs that I have seen that kids and young adults have used to indicate somebody is not, not smart enough to know what to do. Yeah. Um, he's saying, you know, you're going to be subject to the council, or mine says Sanhedrin, which was the council, or moron, you'll be subject to hellfire. Now, I don't think he's saying here that if you get angry at somebody and you call them a fool, I don't think that means that you're going to hell. I mean, hellfire can be interpreted as, as hell. I don't think that's what he's saying. But he amplifies it when you look at 23 
and 24. 23 says, So if you're offering your gift on the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. So why do we need to be on right terms with our brother if we're going to worship God? That's, that's what he's saying. In order to have a right relationship with God, you got to be in a right relationship with your brother, however you define brother. Because when we're mad at people, when we are calling people fools and morons, that type of attitude will affect our relationship with God. Um, we are not treating people the way Jesus' disciples are taught to treat people. Go back to the Beatitudes again. When, in each of those Beatitudes talk about how we should be treating other people, or several of them talk about how we should be treating other people. And if we're not following them, then it's going to affect our relationship with not only them, but our relationship with God. Verse 25 says... Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer, and you'll be thrown into prison. I assure you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. Does the spec get better over time? If you're angry at somebody and fighting with somebody, does it get better over time? It should. <laughs> we would hope it would. Do some people hold a grudge longer than others? I think what he's telling us here is that when we have an offense against somebody, if we don't make it right, the consequences don't get better. They get worse as time goes on. This can be read not only to say if you have a, for lack of a better term, civil dispute with somebody, it doesn't get better if you just let it fester. I think it can also be read that ultimately you're going to stand before the judge and you, you can see the judge as God here and it's going to interfere with our relationship with him if we don't make it right with the brother. Does that make sense? So Jesus took a relatively, you know, what was it, four, you know, three word commandment do not murder. I think it's four in the Exodus. You shall not murder. Um, and expanded it to include basically our attitude towards our brothers and the people that we deal with all the time. Because we can murder without doing physical harm. Have you known of situations where people's reputation has been murdered because of gossip that goes around? some cases it can be worse than physically killing somebody because you kill their reputation in the community. So he's taken a very simple commandment and expanded it to include basically our relationship with our fellow man and how that's going to impact our relationship with God himself. Okay, comments on the first comparison. Anybody? Okay, so he goes on from murder to adultery and divorce. And we're going to hit those two, and then we're going to quit there. We'll do the rest of them next week. So let's look at uh, adultery. If you're looking in Deuteronomy, that's Deuteronomy 2014, and it simply says, you shall not commit adultery. Pretty simple and straightforward. So what does Jesus have to say about committing adultery? Oh, Janice, would you read 
27 through 30. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if that right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for, the, for thee that one of thy members should perish and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if that right uh, hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Okay. 27 says, You have heard that it was said, Do not commit adultery. Okay, those good old Pharisees again, they interpreted that literally. So do not commit adultery the way they interpreted it was the physical act of adultery. Notice what Jesus does. He expands it from the physical, I guess I could say to the moral aspect of adultery and what leads to it. In verse 28, he says, But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in her heart. So in other words, your attitude when you look at a person, and you know, here he's talking to guys, so he's talking about a guy looking at a woman, but the same thing can be said the opposite side. Guy, a gal looking at a guy can go both ways. Um, if you look at them and your attitude is I want to have sex with them. Be blunt. I want to have sex with them. And it's not your spouse? Then you've committed adultery. That can be some step on somebody's toes, not anybody here. Um, it can be something like looking at pornography. Pornography is a big thing in the U.S. today. There are all kinds of pornography sites out there. But it's basically, if you use it, you are committing adultery. This is me talking. I'm taking this a little bit further, but if you're looking at pornography and you're married, you're committing adultery for me because you have looked at another person, not your spouse, with the idea that you want to have sex with them. That's my expansion of it, okay? But I think it's a valid point. Um, and then we really get interesting. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your parts of your body than your whole body go into hell. This is what's called hyperbole in English grammar. H-Y-P-E-R-B-O-L-E. -E, hyperbole. In other words, it's saying something outrageous to make a point. Jesus isn't telling you if you look at somebody with lust, you should pluck out your eye. What good does that do? The problem isn't that your eye looked what your mind thought. It's a mental issue. It's a, a moral judgment. It's not the eye that's at fault. It's the brain that's at fault. Or the heart. You know, They thought the heart was the seat of emotion and judgment then. So... He's not literally saying, if you're, you know, he did literally say, but he doesn't mean literally, pluck your eye out or cut off your hand. It's hyperbole. It's an exaggeration to make a point. Although, believe it or not, one of the writers that I looked at said that some of the early church leaders actually took it um, literally and thought that if somebody was a sexual deviant, the way to cure it was castration. 
That's not what he's saying, folks. <laughs> he's saying, look at where the lust originated. It originates in the heart and the head. What goes in your eyes will eventually come out your mouth. So he's exaggerating. Mutilating the body does not solve the problem. The problem is a moral issue, and that is what he's addressing here. Marriage is intended to be, as he says in the next couple of verses, one man and one woman for life. So, Randy, would you read 31 and 32, and we'll close up with that. Okay. This is actually follows right on. Now we've got adultery. Now we're going to go to divorce. <laughs> 31 32. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay. This is not quoting the Ten Commandments. And if you look at, in my Bible at least, it's red letters... And it's bold print red letters. Whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. That's bold print red letters. So Jesus said it, but in this case, he's quoting from what would be our Old Testament. He's quoting from the Mosaic Law. So Deuteronomy 24.1 is possibly what he's thinking about. This is what that says. Deuteronomy 24.1. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends us from his house, then she is basically divorced. We'll stop there. He goes on and talks about marrying again and so forth. But Moses says back here in Deuteronomy that if, if you do not want to be married to your wife any longer, you give her a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, to our modern ears, that may sound a little harsh. But back then, that was actually a protection for the woman. Moses was not um, not giving his approval for divorce, and neither was Jesus. Moses is saying here, if you, for whatever reason, divorce your wife, you give her a certificate of divorce, then she's free to leave and remarry, is what Moses said. Back then, a guy could simply say, I divorce you, and throw you out of the house. But he could also take you back the next day, and the next day throw you out of the house again. And next day, bring you back in. The guys ruled. They did whatever they wanted to do. When it came, women were considered to be almost property, more so than, you know, a joint equal spouse, as we talked about in Song of Solomon and, and Romans earlier. Um, it kept the husband from abusing the wife if he gave her a certificate of divorce, and it freed her to then go on with her life without being pulled back into that relationship. Jesus expanded it to say, though, that the only reason allowable for divorce is cases of sexual immorality. And basically, the way this is interpreted is if one spouse, man or woman, is um, in unrepentant, ongoing adultery, has no intention of breaking it off, then Jesus is saying here, you can be divorced. The problem, though, comes in the last part of that verse 32, where it says, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So if you divorce under this rule, if you divorced your wife or husband for sexual immorality, unrepentant, ongoing adultery, who's your option to remarry? You don't get one. 
there's there is one it's a trick question brandy mm -hmm. it's the same guy who divorced you because he says if you marry anybody else it's adultery now that's not how we interpret today but that's the way this would have been back then Jesus has narrowed it down that the only reason for justifiable divorce is if there is unrepentant adultery going on by one member of the marriage couple. And if they divorce, the only allowable remarriage is to each other. So basically what we're looking at is he's saying, I think here, that reconciliation between the couple is still the best way to go. If it's possible, that reconciliation is the right way to do it because he has said in other places and in the Old Testament, like I said a minute ago, marriage is a one-to-one -one forever relationship. Now, I realize society and customs change, and that's, I'm sorry to say, not how a good part of society today views it, but that's the way it was intended. A one-to-one -one forever relationship. So even if he gave her the certificate of divorce, she really couldn't go and marry somebody else without them committing adultery. If you read this literally, yep, that's what it says. Yeah, but he commits adultery, not her. Whoever marries her commits the adultery. If it's, if it's a female, whoever marries her commits the adultery because right. she was married to another guy. Yeah. But she does it. She remains simple. Yeah, it, it, that's the way it would seem to look literal reading. But again, the point here is not who she can remarry. The point here is they need to reconcile because the marriage is intended to be forever one-to-one -one. The intent here is to emphasize the reconciliation, not the fact that you can marry somebody else. So, any other comments about adultery or divorce? They're kind of hot button topics, I guess. <laughs> well, when you look at divorce today, the last time I saw anything, we're looking at what? 50% of marriages end in divorce. Now, I don't know how many of those are multiple divorces because there are people who have multiple divorces. So I don't know how many of those we have, but I think the last I looked, the marriage divorce rate was something like 50%. And um, again, I'm quoting from memory, but I don't think it's that much better for people who profess to be Christian, religious. I don't think it's that, I don't think it's that much better. I'll preach a minute. It's too easy to get a divorce today, in my opinion. And I'll leave it with that. <laughs> you are so right. <laughs> it's way too easy to get a divorce today, in, in my opinion. Okay. Sometimes the younger people, oh, well, if it doesn't work out, mm -hmm. they go in with that attitude. If it doesn't work, I know we could have divorced. Yeah. Yep. I could get on my soapbox for a while on that, but I'll <laughs> I won't I won't preach to the choir in this case. Okay, so murder, adultery, and divorce. Basically things that are related to two of the Ten Commandments. But ultimately the problem was the Pharisees were looking at it as very, very literal. Do not murder. As long as I don't kill you, I didn't break the commandment. Do not commit adultery. As long as I don't commit the physical act, I haven't committed adultery. And Jesus is saying here, you have missed the point. Look at the spirit of what I'm trying to tell you, not at the legal word, but I'm that you're reading. Look at the spirit. You know, we say sometimes, you know, don't just look at the um, meaning of the words, but look at the spirit behind the words. 
and that's not the exact quote. It's said another way, but you get the point. You know, look at what is intended, and this is what Jesus is teaching his disciples as an example of how they should look at God's love for work. Okay, we're going to stop there. We're about halfway through that section. Next week, we'll pick up with verse 33, and we'll talk about telling the truth, going the extra mile, and loving your enemies. It doesn't get easier. Okay, any other comments or something that stood out to you in the three sections we looked at today? Or Thank you for participating. Um, we'll be back here, as far as I know, next Wednesday at 6.30. And so let's close with prayer. And uh, I know some of you have places to be, so let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day, for watching over us. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for these examples that you have given us, how your word is not only the literal words, but the spirit behind it that we need to look at. Help us to be loving to those around us. Help us to be loving in the right spirit. May we be the light and the salt of the world that you have called us to be in our daily lives as well as when we're at church. We pray again tonight that uh, you be with the ones who are on our prayer list tonight. Just keep them in the holler of your hand. And we ask that you uh, bring us back on Sunday. We ask it in thy name. Amen.